Well, uh, thank you, James, for those uh, kind words of introduction. Um, James and I have worked together, especially, as he said, at the time of the Lisbon Treaty, when uh, uh, our lawyers were very busy trying to figure things out for us, and it was great to have James as a colleague at that time as the legal advisor. Um, about a year ago, I got a call from the University of Virginia uh, in Charlottesville. And they, they asked me if I would come and speak at the university as part of what they call their ambassador series. Every year they invite two or three ambassadors to come over the course of the academic year and to speak to their students, staff, and the general public in the Charlottesville area. So Green and I went down, and they gave me carte blanche. They said, you can talk about whatever you want. So I had the thought, well, University of Virginia was founded by Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Independence. And the lecture was given this year in April. And of course, this is the centenary of our Declaration of Independence. So I thought, well, what else could I possibly speak about other than declaring independence, America 1776, Ireland 1919. I went down and I gave the talk and it was full of a mixture of Irish Americans, of course, who always turn up wherever I go to uh, support me and uh, give me, uh, you know, the ancient order of Hibernians are always there, you know, acting as a kind of foot soldiers in case there's any messing, you know. <laughs> and, um, and then, um, of course, a lot of Jeffersonians including the president of the International Jefferson Society, a man by the name of Andrew O'Shocknessy, who was born in Britain but with an Irish parent and he's an Irish passport holder. So it was, it was a very nice occasion. So, and I spoke in the Rotunda Room, which was designed by Jefferson, and it's where Jefferson, shortly before his death, um, dined with the Marquis de Lafayette, the French aristocrat who was coming back on a kind of a, kind of a farewell tour in, of America in the 1820s, having been involved... 50 years before in America's independence struggle. So now, I decided to look at the two declarations of independence and the backdrop to them. And the American Declaration of Independence is an epoch-making document. It represents a, a milestone moment in global history. And the words that Jefferson wrote in the Declaration's opening paragraphs, I quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, those are probably among the most famous political statements in world history. So this is a, a declaration that has, has achieved a kind of canonical status. And in America, it is revered. It wasn't always revered, by the way, to the same degree. Only decades after the Declaration did it start to achieve this status and Jefferson start to be uh, lionized as the author of the Declaration of Independence. On Jefferson's gravestone at Monticello, it, um, it lists his achievements and it includes author of the Declaration of Independence. It doesn't include President of the United States, strangely enough. But there you are. He obviously, by the end of his life at least, he had come to see his authorship of the Declaration as the thing that would immortalize him rather than the fact that he was America's third president. Now, by contrast, Ireland's Declaration of Independence is practically unknown, even in Ireland. It was overshadowed, of course, by the proclamation of the Irish Republic issued in 1916. And it's received, the 1919 declaration has, has achieved little or no attention, attracted little or no attention from historians. In fact, there are, there, there are books about that period of Irish history which don't mention the declaration at all. The declaration was misfortunate in the sense that the day it was issued, was the day when the ambush took place at Solahed Beg. And of course, that started the War of Independence. At least we normally think of that incident now as the start of our War of Independence. So by contrast, what was happening in Dublin seemed to be quite um, less important. Um, and I think that's 
that's unfortunate that we, we have such a, a limited uh, grasp of the significance of what happened in 1919. So, for example, whereas the story of Jefferson's authorship of the Declaration has been the subject of hundreds of books, every aspect of it has been explored in great detail, we don't even know when the Irish Declaration was written, by whom it was written, or how it was written. So it is a forgotten declaration. And I think that it's unfortunate that it, that it has not achieved the attention it deserves. Because when I compare the two documents, of course it's not Jeffersonian. It's not, it doesn't have the quality of those words that I read out at the beginning of my talk. But it's not bad. As a document, it actually stands up reasonably well uh, to scrutiny, even though it was clearly written in a bit of a rush, and we don't even know who the author was. So it seems to me, anyway, that dis despite the fact that we have the 1916 proclamation, which is, I suppose, venerated in Ireland during the centenary, a copy went around to every school in the country, and therefore uh, it got a lot of, a lot of attention. Um, despite that, it seems to me that the 1919 document was part of a transformational era in modern Irish history, one that bears comparison with its 1776 predecessor. After all, like the American Declaration, our Declaration was adopted by a group of politicians who were representative of the people. In the Irish case, the people who adopted it had been elected in the election, in the general election of December 1918. Moreover, Unlike the 1916 proclamation, but similar to the American Declaration, our Declaration of Independence did set in train a process that eventually led to actual independence, albeit that the legacy of 1916 loomed large for those involved in what turned out to be a three-year struggle for independence. So we ought, I think, to be more conscious and more aware of the legacy of 1919. Because that, for me, was the moment when Irish independence became an irreversible reality. It took a few years to achieve it, but I think by 1919, with that Declaration of Independence, the first all, I think we were on the road to independence, and that road um, culminated in the Anglo-Irish Treaty and the foundation of the Irish Free State in, in 1922. Now, the... I'm not an American historian, but I've read a lot of books about American history, and especially in the last two years. I find history to be the best doorway into understanding a country where you come to live for a number of years. And I have a huge... Even before I went, I actually had a large library of books on American history, so I'm, I'm, now, I'm, now, I'm now having a chance to read them again and to read them with a more, more practical, focused uh, attention on America. So, ironically, America had its revolution just after the time when the, the togetherness of Britain and its colonies was highly underlined. Because in the, what the Americans call the, the um, French and Indian Wars, what we call the Seven Years' War, the American colonies had fully supported their motherland, Britain, in its war against France. And George Washington had been a an officer in the British Army fighting against the French in that war. So there's a certain irony that within 15 years of a war which brought Americans and British people together like never before, fighting in a significant global conflict, America started to make its way towards independence. The problem was that the, the war was successful for Britain, but it impoverished the exchequer, and they were felt obliged to extract some more uh, resources, some more financial resources from their colonies, and that effort to tax the colonies spurred a resistance movement in, the in, in America, in, in the 13 colonies, and ultimately it led to a rebellion. So, but unlike the Irish Declaration, where you had an election in December 1918, and four weeks later, because the election results weren't declared 
until 28th of December 1918. Four weeks later, in fact, a little over three weeks later, you had a Declaration of Independence. In the American case, the first um, Continental Congress met in 1774, the second one met in 1775, and neither of those, despite the fact that they were preceded by the Boston Tea Party, neither of those um, Congresses led to any declaration of independence. In fact, those first two Congresses were looking for something, they were looking for reform, they were looking for the King of Britain, King George III, and the British government to respect what they considered to be the rights, their rights as colonists and as British citizens. So they were not driven to immediately declare independence in the way that our members of parliament elected in December 1918 were immediately prompted to declare independence. So, in fact, throughout the war of independence in America between 1775 and 1783, many American-born colonists fought for the British and actively opposed independence. About 20,000 American-born colonists fought on the British side against the independence movement. And about 60,000 to 80,000 left America during and after the revolution and went to Canada or to Britain. Now, some of them came back afterwards and were reintegrated into American society. So there was, there was a very strong loyal element in America even in the 1770s when there, this revolutionary ferment was taking over the country. For me at least, it seems that the, the key factor in American independence was America's distance from Britain. It, was simply, it simply became impossible for Britain to assert its control over such distant colonies and colonies that had developed their own sense of identity and their own economic wherewithal that enabled them to resist the attempts by the British government in the 1770s to bring the American Revolution to heel. Now, and of course, America was also fortunate to have the support of Britain's chief rival as a great power in the late 18th century, that was France. So they were, they were fortunate to be distant from Britain, which made it more difficult for the British to impose their will upon them. And they had the support of France that was only looking for opportunities to get back at Britain following the defeat they suffered in the Seven Years' War. So the point I want to make here is that when America became independent, it was really a unique political experiment. Because at that time, the Americas were controlled by four powers, by Spain, Portugal, France, and Britain. And indeed, all of Europe was essentially controlled by five great powers, all of them empires or monarchies, Britain, France, Austria, Turkey, and Russia. So America was really a disruptor, a big disruptor in the politics of the world in the 1770s. And there was little or no precedent in European history for an, for an exercise of the kind that the American colonies undertook in the 1770s and 1780s. To become independent without opting for the monarchical system. So America's independence movement had a major effect on Ireland. And I just quote Roy Foster here, who has put it as follows, and I quote, the radicalization of Irish political life was part of one great theme from the 1770s, the impact of America, end quote. This led to the rise of a form of colonial nationalism and ultimately to the republicanism of the 1798, United Irishmen of 1798. And the rebellion of 1798 was inspired by example from America and from France. And it became the foundational moment in modern Irish political history. And 20th century Irish nationalism, of the kind that brought about our uh, political transformation in the second decade and third decades of the 20th century, had traced its roots to the United Irishmen. And those who met in Dublin in 1919 would at least have been conscious of the legacy of the United Irishmen. 
as one 1916 participant, Sean McEntee, who went on to become a senior figure in successive Fianna Fáil governments in the 30s, 40s and 50s, as he put it, without Wolf Tone, quote, there might not have been a rising and almost certainly not a Republic of Ireland. So they were conscious in 1916 of that legacy from 1798, which was also in its turn inspired by the American Revolution and the French Revolutions of the 1770s and 1780s. So, just let me make another point about the, the um, what happened after the American War of Independence. Even though the American, these ideas that Jefferson wrote in his declaration were of global significance and are now seen as part of the, the patrimony of, of world political thought, it didn't have any real effect in Europe at least. It is true that in Latin America, a series of countries broke free from the from the empires of Spain and Portugal and established republics of various kinds. But in Europe, I don't know, now there are probably people here who can tell me I'm wrong here, but I don't know, apart from France, in fact, by 1914, there were only three states in Europe that weren't either empires or monarchies or principalities or something of that kind, Liechtenstein and whatever. The only exception to that rule was France, obviously the legacy of the 1789 uh, French Revolution, Portugal, which was a republic in 1914, and Switzerland, which was a kind of a, what it is today, a confederation of some kind, but certainly not a monarchy. So 130 years after the American Revolution, 140 years after the American Revolution, there were only three republics, only three non-monarchies and empires in Europe. So the American impact on political organization in the world was confined to Latin America. It had very little resonance in Europe, except in Ireland, because the republican tradition, which I think was inspired by the Irish Americans to a large extent, the Fenian movement was to a great degree an American movement. I recently visited Buffalo in northern New York, and I visited the Niagara River, and there is a monument there to the 800 Fenians who crossed the Niagara River and invaded Canada in 1866 as part of a rather madcap scheme to conquer Canada and then trade Canada for Ireland uh, with the British. I'm not sure it would ever have worked. And in fact, uh, the government of Andrew Johnson, who was uh, Lincoln's successor, who was impeached afterwards, um, he actually sent a gunboat up to prevent further Fenian incursions into Canada across a fairly narrow stretch of river called the Niagara River. And according to my, to my colleague in Ottawa, he said that invasion of Canada by the Irish Fenians from America was the spur for Canada to come together and form a confederation in order to defend itself against potential repeat efforts on the part of Irish Republicans to take over Canada. So, if you look at it, Belgium broke away from the Netherlands in 1831. That was driven by linguistic and religious differences. Greece became independent in 1832. Serbia, Montenegro, Romania, and Bulgaria, all in the, the kind of late 19th, early 20th centuries. But the backdrop to their independence movements was, in all cases, um, the decline of the Turkish Empire, the decline of the Ottoman Empire. So these were not countries that managed to like the Americans did in the, in the 18th century and the Irish did in the 20, 20th century, to rebel successfully against a successful, powerful empire, those countries took advantage of the decline of the Ottoman Empire, the sick man of Europe in the 19th century. So really, no country in Europe followed the American example throughout the 19th century. So in Ireland's case, it seems to me that the key factor that connects the two independence movements is the fact I just mentioned of the Americans broke free from the most powerful empire of the 19th century, of the 18th century, Britain. And Ireland 
after the First World War, managed to gain independence from one of the victorious countries of the Great War. The other countries that became independent after 1918, the Baltic states, Czechoslovakia, the Kingdom of uh, Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, they all came into being because the empires they were previously part of collapsed. And those countries emerged from the debris of the defeated empires. Only Ireland managed to be, become independent in the um, looking for, um, with, um, from a country that had been successful in the 1914-18 war. So that's why I think the, the two struggles resemble each other. But of course there are, there are major differences. The world of the 20th century was very different from the world of the 18th century. And at least Ireland had the example of the United States, which I think was, was kind of passed on down to the 19th century by the influence of Irish Americans, who of course had spent their lives when they moved from Ireland or uh, were born in America of Irish parents, spent their lives living in a republic. And therefore, for them, you know, the republican way of doing things was, was absolutely normal and natural. So the difference was that, of course, in the American case, distance benefited America greatly. It was very difficult for Britain to impose its will on these distant colonies. In the Irish case, proximity was a major problem for anyone seeking to gain independence for Ireland in the 19th century. And that's why most of the efforts that um, took place during the 19th century failed pretty miserably because the odds were really stacked badly against uh, any movement in Ireland that might have tried to secure independence for us during the 19th century. So a neighbouring island, we were seen as intrinsic to imperial security. Also, Ireland was more deeply divided in the 19th century than America was in the 18th. There were pronounced ethnic and religious differences in Ireland, which existed to some degree in the United States, but not to the same degree as in Ireland. And also, there were lots of loyalists in America, but they were, they were scattered all over the 13 colonies. In Ireland, they were concentrated in, in one part of the country, which made, of course, things much more difficult from the point of view of trying to secure um, any political progress, um, uh, home rule or anything that might be more advanced than home rule. But also, of course, there was sustained resistance to British rule in Ireland in the 18th and 19th centuries of a kind that didn't exist in America. I mean, I, I, I made the point earlier that loyalty was very strong in America up to the revolutionary period when suddenly the whole thing dissolved, although there were many people who remained loyal to, the, um, to Britain despite the upheavals of the revolutionary period. So in the, other ex the other similarity between the two struggles is that in the American case, the struggle was brought about in the aftermath of the Seven Years' War. It was a consequence of the Seven Years' War. And the Irish independence movement was a consequence of the First World War. It was a consequence of the failure to deliver home rule by 1914, and therefore Ireland going into the war with the nationalist community divided and a significant group of Irish volunteers determined to not to fight in the battlefields of the Great War, but rather to uh, seek to advance Ireland's political claims at home. So that was, that was, also, a very, that was also a similarity. So the, so the deferral of home rule, for me, was crucial uh, to um, the emergence of an independent struggle. Now, the 1916 proclamation for me is an impressive document as it um, asserts Ireland's historic right to independence in language that still reads well today. It begins resoundingly in the name of God and the dead generations from which she receives her old traditions of nationhood. Ireland through us summons her children to her flag and strikes for her freedom. Now, it seems to me that if Ireland had a Thomas Jefferson, it was probably Patrick Pierce because my own argument here is that with Jefferson, it was the ideas of the Scottish Enlightenment, essentially, that, 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 
influenced him to write the way he did. In, in the case of the Irish Revolution, it seems to me that the, the equivalent ideological drive came from what I would call Gaelic nationalism. Because although the Gaelic League failed to revive the Irish language in an independent Ireland, in the period before independence, the Gaelic League was a major driver of the, uh, it was a major inspiring force behind the demand for independence. The idea that even if we got home rule, it wouldn't be enough because we were a different people, we had a different identity, we had a different background, a different culture. So, now, Pierce has been criticised, of course, for his, Im for his messianic embrace of, of violent insurrection and blood sacrifice. But the point I would make is that Thomas Jefferson also once spoke about the tree of liberty needing to be manured by blood. Now, like Jefferson, um, or like um, Pierce, Jefferson was, was appalled by violence when it actually happened, because he wasn't a great warrior by any means, and I think nor was Pierce, because apparently in the post office in 1916 he wasn't particularly you know, effective, because the actual reality of violence was different from, from... So in other words, both of them had this idea and of course, Jefferson also left himself open to charges of hypocrisy on account of his attitude to slavery, uh, considering um, his statement that all men are created equal. So it seems to me that the Gaelic League, and through Pierce and people like him, provided the sort of some of the drive, some of the inspirational force that gave rise to Irish independence. Another difference between the two movements is that. The leaders of the 1916 Rising, and indeed some of the subsequent leading figures, didn't survive the War of Independence and become part of the fabric of an independent Ireland. Griffith died in 1922, Collins died in 1922, Pierce, Connolly, and uh, McDonough and all of those died in 1916. America had the great good fortune that all of the leading figures in the independence movement in advance of 1776 all survived. And in fact, Washington remarkably, although he was apparently quite reckless in battle and rode to the front in his big horse, and he, he survived miraculously, was, was injured, wounded a few times, but never seriously so. And so, in America, the first three presidents were three people very strongly associated with the independence movement. You had Washington, you had John Adams, and you had Thomas Jefferson. And indeed, you can go on, on to Madison and Monroe and John Quincy Adams. All of them in this kind of um, succession. All, if you like, descended directly, in the case of John Quincy Adams, from the founding fathers of the American Revolution. So they did have that advantage of being able to, to, um, to have the leading figures still around. I mean, Jefferson, after all, survived 50 years after the Declaration of Independence. So in a sense, in terms of longevity, he's a bit more akin to de Valera, I guess, um, who also managed, of course, to benefit greatly from being the founding father of the Republic as a surviving commander of the um, Easter Rising. So, in both cases, it seems to me that the problem was that the metropolitan power was insensitive to the situation that existed in America in the 1770s, in Ireland in the second decade of the 20th century, and made errors of judgment. Uh, in the British case, the error of judgment in Ireland was to try to impose military conscription on Ireland in 1918. And I, I have a letter that W.B. Yeats wrote to a member of the British cabinet saying to him, why are you doing this? This is, this is insane. For the sake of 50,000 troops, you're willing to drive another trench between our two countries. So there were misjudgments made by the British government in the 1770s in um, America and in the 20th century in Ireland. So the American Declaration, although it's famous for the words that I quoted a little earlier, um, it's also actually quite a pedestrian and prosaic document because most people only know the bit I read. Most Americans only know the bit I read. Uh, 
but most of the texts, most of Jefferson's texts, is like a legal document. It's the kind of document that James would be very happy analyzing because, or writing, <laughs> because it reads much more like a, a legal case you might make against the British government in court than it does a political tract. I mean, the first few paragraphs are obviously a political tract. But actually, the, the most important part of the declaration was not that bit, because that only attracted a, a very small number of trivial amendments that were made by the Congress as a whole when they, when they, when, when they examined uh, Jefferson's text. But the body of the text is actually a long, long list of grievances against the British government. So he says at the beginning, uh, he says, when there is a need to dissolve established political bands, it is necessary to, and I quote, declare the causes which impel them to the separation. In other words, you have to make a case, a legal case. And he talks about a, a history of repeated injuries and usurpations which had led to an absolute tyranny over the colonies. So they were, Jefferson and his friends and colleagues, they look back to the glorious revolution of 1688. And for them, the, the government of King George had abandoned those principles and they were trying to reassert their rights as British citizens under the 1688 settlement. And the list of grievances includes a lot of rather, you know, important but but not particularly, you know, resounding charges, refusing to assent to laws, dissolving representative colonial assemblies, obstructing the administration of justice, interfering with the independence of judges, keeping standing armies in place in times of peace, and cutting off the colonies' trade with the rest of the world. So there are 27 charges in all laid by Jefferson. And basically, on that basis, Jefferson concludes that King George III is, quote, unfit to be the ruler of a free people, end quote. Nevertheless, the, the American states, he says, had sought to secure redress from Britain for these long list of grievances, but the British had been, quote, deaf to the voice of justice and consanguinity. In other words, not only were they not just in the way they handled America, according to Jefferson, but they also failed to recognize the blood relations between the colonies and their mother country. So the upshot of all of this was an assertion that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent. So, in other words, it's a very reluctant document. It states these very st strong general principles, but it then, it then feels a need to lay out the case for independence in a very loyally document, which co constitutes about two-thirds of the total declaration. Now, the Irish declaration is very different because in the case of the declaration of independence, issued on the 21st of January, 1919. There's no need in the eyes of the people who adopted that document to justify the case for Irish independence. They simply say, and I, I quote, whereas for 700 years the Irish people has never ceased to repudiate and has repeatedly protested in arms against foreign usurpation. English rule in Ireland was described as being, and I quote, based upon force and fraud and maintained by military occupation against the declared will of the people, full stop. In other words, you didn't have to go into this laundry list of things, bad things King George had done. You simply referred to the 700 years of foreign occupation. That was enough. And that was because the people who wrote the declaration saw themselves as standing in a long tradition. Whether this was right or wrong is another matter, but for them, they saw themselves as standing in a long tradition of resistance to foreign rule, and therefore didn't need to make the Jeffersonian case against the British government in the second decade 
of the 20th century. And they saw the, dec the, the Declaration of Independence as a ratification of the Republic proclaimed in 1916. They pledged themselves, and I quote, to make this declaration effective by every means at our command. This is very similar to the closing lines of Jefferson's text, quote, and for the, su and for the support of this declaration with firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So in both cases, the revolutionaries were determined to break free from British rule and committed themselves to doing everything possible to achieve that outcome. Now, although there are no soaring passages equivalent to Jefferson's evocation of humanity's inalienable rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, the Irish Declaration does contain an aspirational agenda to promote the common weal, to re-establish justice, and to constitute a national policy based upon the people's will with equal rights and equal opportunity for every citizen. So the Irish Declaration was also overshadowed by two other documents issued on the same day. One was the address to the free nations of the world, and the second was the democratic program. Now, the free nations of the world declaration is the declaration that um, James and I have um, been inspired by for all of our careers, because that's the founding document, really, of Irish foreign policy, and um, both of us have served a good number of years now uh, of the hundred years when our, when our uh, Department of Foreign Affairs has been in existence. Uh, you know, we served, if you like, under the umbrella of that declaration. And then, of course, there was a democratic program, which is a bit equivalent to the American Bill of Rights, because it goes to, it sets out a, a very, um, uh, you know, very ambitious, um, uh, uh, the language is, you know, we affirm that all right to private property must be subordinated to the public right and welfare. Uh, and it talks, it's a decidedly progressive document and obviously hasn't always or wasn't always uh, implemented. Um, so, unfortunately, the declaration was overshadowed by the proclamation of Easter 1916, the outbreak of the War of Independence, and the two other documents uh, issued on the same day, which were rather more dramatic in language and in the intent behind them, because the intent behind the the appeal to the free nations of the world was basically to establish an Irish foreign policy and to send out representatives to try and uh, look for support from around the world for Irish independence. And that's why de Valera spent a year and a half in America in 1919 and 1920 trying to stir up our Irish Americans to support Ireland's case for independence. Now, I said at the beginning, we have no idea who wrote, the, uh, we have no idea who our Thomas Jefferson was, right? However, Dorothy McArdle, who lived through that period and wrote voluminously about the independence struggle, she said, she has written that the documents approved by the first doll were composed by a committee. By the way, Jefferson was part of a committee as well, but he did all the writing of the declaration according to all that we know about that document. It consisted of, uh, of the lawyer, George Gavin Duffy, who ultimately was, was previously the lawyer for, for Roger Casement and subsequently became a member of our delegation to the Treaty Negotiation in 1921 and became the first Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Irish Free State briefly. There was the writer, Pierce Beasley, who went on to, to be a significant figure, born in Liverpool, but became a, a Gaelic League activist and uh, a writer in Irish and English. And then finally, Sean T. O'Kelly. Now, my own guess is that O'Kelly was probably the one with the most political experience in that group, and that probably, if I had to guess, I would say O'Kelly was probably the one who did most of the writing of the Declaration. The Declaration was issued, of course, in three languages, in French, Irish, and English. My guess would be that George Gavin Duffy probably did the French translation, because he was uh, skilled in, in French, and in, he'd lived part of his life in France uh, growing up, uh, and that maybe Pierce Beasley translated the declaration into Irish. But my guess is that Sean T. O'Kelly was probably the one, uh, and he had a very, very important career afterwards, uh, uh, you know, and the, and the important, because he was president, tarnished uh, a minister for finance. So not a bad, not, you know, not a bad career, akin really to Jefferson, who was um, first secretary of state, second vice president, and third president. He was one, two, three. So O'Kelly, 
had a pretty good career in Irish politics afterwards. Um, but nowhere in, in the documents I've read about O'Kelly, uh, his entry in the Dictionary of Irish Biography, nowhere mentions him uh, as the um, author of the Declaration of Independence. So obviously it wasn't something that he or anyone else felt a need to proclaim their authorship of in the way that Jefferson fiercely at the end of his life protected um, his legacy as the sole author of the Declaration of Independence. The other thing that's similar is that O'Kelly, like Jefferson, when he wrote the Declaration in 1919, was in his 30s. So here you have a similar case of a, a young generation of people asserting themselves and throwing off um, the traditions that had ruled their countries for decades and generations before that. So finally, just to conclude, um, uh, the American and Irish revolutions were separated by 140 years, but they were similar in a number of respects. It succeeded because in both cases, the British government made important missteps and fatally underestimated their opponents. In the 1770s, the British thought that they would wipe the Americans out in one good battle and that would be the end of it. And they, you know, they learned to regret that um, notion that they could achieve such, a, such an outcome. And in Ireland as well, I think the British government initially underestimated the, the determination of those who were involved in the War of Independence. In the very different circumstances in which they operated, both sets of revolutionaries exhibited tenacity and determination, which eventually saw them triumph against the odds of power politics, against the most powerful empires of the 18th and 20th centuries. Ireland's Declaration of Independence is clearly a cousin of its Irish counterpart. Even the choice of its title seems to me to suggest that a conscious comparison was being sought between the Irish Declaration and the American one of 140 years before. Our Declaration was also heir to a rich vein of nationalist thought from Wolf Tone in the 1790s, Robert Emmett in 1803, and the Young Irelanders of the 1840s and the Fenian movement of the 1860s, plus, and I insist on this, the many Irish parliamentarians of the 19th century who were in their own way kept alive the flame of a separate Irish political identity, in their case to be achieved through home rule. I do not expect that Ireland's Declaration of Independence will ever acquire the iconic status enjoyed by Jefferson's masterwork, but it seems to me it ought to be better known than it is. It's not bad. Thank you. Thank you.